speaking today is Dr. Graham Tomlin. Dr. Graham Tomlin is a member of the team here, a member of the staff team here, but he's also the principal of St. Melitus Theological College, which he founded. We've, we've, we started here together with the Bishop of London, and it has grown. Just to give you a, a, a feel of the scale of it, the, the, the Theological College tend to have about 30 to 50 ordinands. The largest one or well, the second largest one has 73. He started with zero seven years ago. Now they have 173 ordinands and 600 students in that college. This is an astonishing achievement. And it's not just about being the biggest or whatever. It's about these are people who are being trained to go and run churches that will thrive and bring people to faith, like Tim Matthews, who goes off to um, Bournemouth and sees within 20 weeks 500 people coming to church. That's what we want to see all over the country. That's Graham's vision. That's what he's doing. He has, he, he's running it here. There are hubs in different parts of the country that are training up people to run churches to see the revitalization of the church. So we're thrilled that Graham is here. I recommend all his books. There are lots of them down in the bookshop, and they're all brilliant. And Graham is brilliant, and we're thrilled he's speaking to us today. So would you give a very warm welcome to Dr. Graham Tomlin. Thank you, Nikki, very much indeed. We're going to uh, read our passage as we begin this um, new series together. It's in 1, Ch 1 Peter, and uh, if you've got a Bible, you may want to follow it and keep it open, because we're going to refer to it as we go through, but uh, it's up on the screen anyway, so uh, if you just want to follow it on the screen, you can do so. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so as we sit, let's pray. Father, it's our prayer this morning that we will hear your voice speaking directly to us, to our hearts, to our minds, to the whole of our lives. And we pray that as we leave this place today, we may leave full of your love, your joy, your peace, and your hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here with you and uh, great to have uh, those of you down at uh, Onslow Square. Um, I cannot see you, but I believe in you. <laughs> and uh, we are beginning today together across the whole of the church a uh, new series uh, called uh, Radical Community. And uh, we're looking at doing it through this letter of 1 Peter. That's what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And 1 Peter is, of course, a uh, it's a kind of circular letter. It was written um, to Christians scattered in over provinces in the, uh, the Roman Empire, particularly in the part of it that now we now know of as Turkey, the sort of Asia Minor. Here were Christians in little churches scattered over that part of the Roman Empire. This is the letter written to them to be circulated amongst these um, particular places. 
Now, this is uh, r relatively early in the years of the church, maybe 30, 40 years after Jesus died and rose again. And um, the situation into which this letter is written is quite significant, I think, for us. Because uh, when you start asking the question, who were these people to which the letter was written? Then um, maybe you get a clue to it in verse 2 of the reading we had. Because it uses um, uh, a verse there, actually in verse 1, a little, little word there that describes these people. They are... Um, Parapidemos, that's the Greek word there. It's a word that is translated in our version here, exile, but it could be translated refugee. They are, if you like, spiritual refugees. Now, we know all about refugees in our world because we know there are many of them in this country and in countries across the world. And a refugee is someone who is kind of dislocated. They don't really belong. They don't speak the language. They maybe sit on street corners with nothing much to do. They don't fit in. They live in a place, but they don't really feel they belong there. And these people to whom this letter is written are, if you like, spiritual refugees. That's what it feels like. Because they are people who don't quite feel at home in the culture in which they live. They're not exactly persecuted. There's not much we get in this letter that suggests that they are about to be killed for their faith or to be, uh, um, to be tortured for it. But they are very aware they don't fit into that wider culture. They don't do what everyone else does. And they face all kinds of subtle hostility to the faith that they have. Now, we get little hints of that through the letter. In um, verse 8 here, we get this little, thing, little phrase that says, uh, you, you have not seen him. And you can hear the voice of the critics, you can hear the voice of the people around saying, well, you, you Christians, you say you believe in this Jesus Christ, but you've never seen him. Show me Jesus. Show him to me, I'll believe in him. And of course, the Christians have to reply, well, I, I can't show you Jesus. And yet, yes, you're right, I've, I've never actually seen him. Again, uh, elsewhere in our reading this morning, it has that phrase, you suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And here are these Christians who are aware that they do suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They are subject to the same things that every other person is subject to. They suffer disappointment, loss, bereavement. They have slaves who are, have to endure difficult masters. And you can almost hear the voice of the critics saying, well, you know, what has your God to help done to help you through that? If you believe in a God who made the world, why does he allow all these things to happen to you? And then there are other things that maybe, particularly because they're Christians in chapter 2, um, it says, they malign you as evildoers. They say, you Christians, you think you're so good, but in fact, you're a really bad influence upon our society. You're taking people away from the true path of life. You do more harm than good. Chapter 3, there's a picture of Christian wives, many Christian wives who are married to husbands who aren't Christians, and those husbands give their wives quite a bit of stick and a bit of a hard time because they go to church and they want to bring their children up as Christians and so on. Chapter 3, there's that little word, intimidation. It feels like, well, it's not really hard persecution, but you sometimes feel intimidated in a culture which is quite hostile to your faith. It talks about suffering for doing what is right in a culture which wants to just erode what is doing what is right. And just the, the insistence on doing that makes you quite unpopular. Chapter 4, these Christians are criticized because they just don't do what everyone else does. They don't read the books that everyone else reads. They don't watch the films that everybody else watches. Well, there aren't films in the first century, but you know what I mean. In other words, they don't just quite fit in to the culture around them. I don't know if that sounds at all familiar to you. It does sound quite familiar to me. We often, of course, have that feeling that our faith is something that is not persecuted. We don't face that in the way that other Christians in the world do. But we do face that subtle pressure, that subtle intimidation, that subtle sense that you don't really belong, that what you believe isn't really worth respecting. A couple of weeks ago, um, Twitter and the internet was full of the um, invective of, of Stephen Fry with his uh, very eloquent 
um, demolition of God, what he would say to God if he met him. And it's not just Stephen Fry. We hear voices all over, the, all, 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 all the time that are kind of ridiculing Christian faith and attacking it and undermining it in all kinds of ways. Now, in that context, which is quite similar to ours, what does Peter say? What theme does he go to in Christian faith? What does he say to these Christians who face exactly these kind of pressures in their lives? Against all of that, Peter places one great fact, one central theme right at the heart of his, the start of this letter. He says this, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, you may not be able to see Jesus. You may face all kinds of griefs and trials. Some of them quite long-standing and deep, the kind of things, the kind of burdens you bear that aren't going to go away in a hurry. But the one thing that we proclaim as Christians is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The one thing the church proclaims is resurrection. Now, why is that so significant? Why does he go straight to resurrection as the heart of his message to these Christians? Now, it may be helpful in this to go back to Stephen Fry, because, uh, of course, his critique of Christian faith is not that dissimilar from some of the ones that, was, uh, that were raised against the Christian faith in its early days as well. And what he says, and what many of our uh, non-Christian friends say to us, is how can you believe in a God in a world of so much evil, suffering, and pain? And we've seen echoes of that critique in the letter already. Now, of course, we can argue until the cows come home about the origins and existence of evil and suffering. Stephen Fry asks, surely God could have created a world in which evil didn't exist. If he's all-powerful, surely he could have done that. Why didn't he create a world in which evil didn't exist? And then I guess we Christians might reply, well, yes, he could. He could have created a world in which evil didn't exist. But then that would be a world in which you and I didn't exist either. Because actually when you think of it, one of the chief causes of evil in our world is the human race. It's us. And if we are asking God to eliminate all causes of evil from his world overnight, he would be eliminating you and me at the same time. Well, atheists may come back and say, well, but surely at the end of the day, it has to be God's fault. He has created a world in which evil is possible, and therefore, he must be responsible. God created evil. And then Christians might reply, well, we don't believe that. We don't recognize the God that Stephen Fry depicts. That's not the God of Christianity. It's the God of deism in the 18th century, if you ever know anything about that. No, God created a good world that has now been broken. That there are forces at work in God's world, both human and superhuman, that simply want to destroy all that God has created. They have turned away from God, and we are involved in this as a human race. And there's a kind of impulse in us somehow that wants to just destroy all that is good and right and beautiful and true. And sometimes we find ourselves overtaken with this, and we, we hurt one another. And we don't even, even know why we do these things. And so evil is this impulse towards destruction, this impulse to destroy the goodness of creation and send it back to the nothingness from which it came. So we Christians say that God is not the author of evil. But in fact, we go beyond that to say that actually in some ways evil cannot be explained. You cannot explain evil because evil is the absence of explanation. There is no reason for evil because evil is the absence of reason. Evil has no purpose because it's the absence of purpose. It is just sheer, random destructiveness. And so asking the question, who created evil, is a bit like taking a chair that's got broken 
and asking the question, who created the brokenness? Well, brokenness is not something that was created. The chair was created. It was a perfectly good chair, but it got broken. Somebody broke it. The brokenness is not a created thing. It's the lack of something. It's the lack of good chairness, if you like. Now, we can have these debates, and we can argue with our friends who are atheists or others about the origins and existence of evil. But at the end of the day, we have to say that we can't really explain the existence of evil because it has no explanation. It is random destructiveness that it, that it, that it just simply, simply wants to destroy and defies explanation. But the point is that neither can the atheists either. If you read Richard Dawkins, he also says that evil is sheer random destructiveness. We end up in the same place. Neither of us can really explain it. Why? Because evil defies explanation. It is the absence of goodness. But the real answer, it seems to me, that Christians give to evil and suffering is this. And this is what brings us back to our theme in our passage today. The real answer is this. But yes, if you're an atheist, you can say, well, because of the evil in the world, I do away with God. I will banish God, as Stephen Fry recommends that we do. But once you've banished God, have you solved the problem of evil and suffering? Of course, you haven't. You haven't explained it. And even more to the point, you've still got to face it. You've still got to deal with it. If you banish God, you still have to somehow deal with bone cancer in children, mental illness, the effects of earthquakes. You still have to deal with your and my own tendency to malice and anger and greed and hatred. And that brings us back to why it is that Peter stresses the resurrection. Because the Christian answer to the troubles of this life, the Christian answer to suffering and evil, whether in the first century or the 21st, is not a philosophical answer that explains the existence of evil, but it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is to say that God in Jesus Christ opposes everything that is evil, everything that wants to destroy the goodness of his world. He sets his face against these things, and he has entered right into the very heart of darkness itself. In the person of Jesus Christ, he took on all the forces of sin and death and hell, and he took them on on the cross, and guess who won? And that's what the resurrection proclaims. The resurrection proclaims the ultimate victory of God. It proclaims the ultimate victory of goodness, of life, of love. If God really was as Stephen Fry depicted him, well, he's right. That really is bad news. A God who stands back and does nothing about the evil that runs around his world and destroys it would be a God who is callous, uncaring, and deserving of all the invective of Stephen Fry his friends, and the rest of us too. In the same way, a God who re resolved to destroy evil and all the causes of evil at a stroke overnight is a God who would be destroying you and me at the same time. That God does not deserve our worship either. But a God who enters into suffering, who endures the worst that evil can do, who stands alongside us in the suffering that we go through, and not only stands alongside us, but overcomes it and defeats it through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and who therefore gives us hope that one day evil will be no more, that suffering will be no more, that is a God I can worship. That is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a very different God from the one that Stephen Fry depicted. You and I may not be able to explain evil, 
and its existence and its origins any more than the atheists can. But we do announce that its days are numbered. And that is something the atheists cannot do. We are the people who know and proclaim, because of the resurrection of Jesus, that life ultimately conquers death. That goodness ultimately conquers evil. That God ultimately conquers suffering. That is what the church proclaims and lives. And we may not see it now. We look forward to that day, but we do see glimpses of it here and now. So that every time someone is healed of sickness, every time someone gets justice who is wrongly accused, every time a homeless person finds shelter, every time someone who comes out of prison finds a welcome and finds the path back to being integrated into society and work and everything else. Those things are significant, not just for what they are, but for what they're a sign of. They're a sign of the day when evil and suffering and death will be no more. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not just a one-off. It was a sign of something much bigger, a sign of what is to come. So that what is true for Jesus can be true for us. And that's why Peter, in this passage, uh, speaks of those who believe in the resurrection, you and me, as being a bit like children who might be poor in the present, we might not have much to live off, but who know that one day they are going to inherit a fortune. That's what Christians are depicted like in this story, that the Christian life may be great, and it is, it's a wonderful life to be a Christian, but it's nothing compared to what will one day be. It's again why it says here, though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why is it that Christians are joyful people? Because they have hope. Because we know that everything ends not in death and destruction, but in life and resurrection. I don't know if you've seen the film Shawshank Redemption. It's uh, one of the great films of hope. It's the story of a man who is uh, falsely imprisoned for life for something he didn't do. And uh, somehow, strangely, through the film, he is kept alive, kept going by this strange thing called hope. And when he's asked the question, what keeps you going given the great injustice that you've suffered, given that there's, there seems to be no great, great future for you. And he says again and again, it's just hope. And in fact, towards the end of the story, one of the characters says this, hope is a good thing, maybe even the best of things. And I reckon Peter would have agreed. Hope is a good thing. It's maybe even the best of things. We human beings are made to live with hope. If you do not have hope, life is pretty well unendurable. If you have hope, you can endure almost anything. If you've got nothing to look forward to, then you very quickly sink into despair. This is something actually that French people know better than English people do. Because, of course, if you think of the French word for hope, it is espoir. And, of course, the French word for despair is désespoir. It's the lack of hope. So what do you do when you take hope away? You get despair. And so often that is underneath it all, the experience of so many people in this city, in this nation, that despite the little kind of hopes that they have underneath there's that gnawing sense of despair that ultimately you do not know what the future holds. There's nothing really to look forward to in this life or even especially beyond it. And that is why the resurrection is at the very heart of Christian faith and proclamation. Karl Marx said famously once or wrote these words, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And on that, he was right. 
The point is not to find some great philosophical explanation for evil and suffering, because it can't be done. The point is to oppose it. The point is to fight against it with everything that we have. And that is what we are mandated to do by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because that is what God did in the cross and the resurrection. So we use all the powers we have, our energies, our prayers, our relationships, our community, to set ourselves against all that is destructive of life and beauty and joy and goodness. And so to these Christians who are despised, dislocated, refugees, who feel out of place in the society in which they live, Peter says two things, and I think these are the two things he'd leave with us today. Number one, be people of hope. Always remember the resurrection. Always remember that there is this inheritance waiting for you. And when you remember the resurrection, it will always bring a little bit of a smile to your face. Whatever you are going through in your life, when you remember the resurrection, that that is where everything ends, then it gives you hope, it gives you life, it gives you joy. And it doesn't matter whether it's in your family or your school or your workplace, wherever it may be, when everyone else despairs, be a person of hope. That is what Christians are. Not an optimist, just thinking that hopefully something might just turn up one day, but a person of hope who knows and believes that everything ends in life and resurrection. But then secondly, create communities of hope. Create a radical community where people can see signs of the day when evil and suffering will one day be gone forever. Create a community in which every now and again sick people get healed because we prayed for them. Where homeless people find shelter because we took the time out to love them. A community in which suffering, bereaved people find love and affirmation and a simple hug because when you're in pain you don't need an explanation, you just need love. What is a radical community? A radical community in our culture is one that has hope in a world which is so often full of despair. It is a community that believes in resurrection and that always has hope, no matter how bleak things sometimes seem. It is a community that lives a life shaped not by the past, nor even by the present, but by the future. And Christians are the only people who can do that because we alone are the ones who know what the future holds. That in the end, life wins, goodness wins, that love wins. Amen.